Welcome, welcome everyone. We are so, so, so delighted to welcome you tonight. Um, my name is Adriana Onitsa, and I'm the editorial director of the Griffin Poetry Prize. And I'm here today with my colleague, Miren Arsanios, social media director. And of course, our special guests, uh, Khaled Matawa and Sarah Riggs. Before we begin, uh, we would like to frame this cross-cultural event by acknowledging that although we are gathered here today in this digital space, we're connected to many indigenous lands and uh, communities. So the Griffin Poetry Prize was founded in Toronto on the traditional lands of many nations, including the Mississaugas of the Credit, uh, the Anishinaabek, the Chippewa, the Haudenosaunee, and the Wendat peoples. And today, this meeting place is still the home to many Indigenous peoples from across Turtle Island. And we're thankful to have the opportunity to live and work on this land. I myself represent Treaty 6 territory in Amiskwachi, Waskahican, or Edmonton, Alberta. So we ask you to join us in acknowledging the Indigenous territories that you are joining us from today in the chat. And as such, we will proceed with this event um, with this relationality in mind, uh, respecting the lands and languages and each other, of course. Thank you, Adriana. And yeah, welcome, everyone. Um, my name is Mira Narsanos, as Adriana said, and I'm joining you from Brooklyn, um, the unceded land of the Munsee Lenape peoples. I would also like to recognize um, the unique and enduring relationship that exists between indigenous people and their traditional territories. Um, before we begin, I'd just like to give a little bit of context on the Griffin Poetry Prize and a little bit of history. Um, so um, in April 2000, uh, Scott Griffin, along with trustees Margaret Atwood, Robert Harris, Michael Ondache, Robin Robertson, and David Young founded the Griffin Trust to raise public awareness of the crucial role poetry plays in society. The current trustees are Mark Doty, Caroline Forche, Scott Griffin, Sarah Howe, Paul Muldoon, Karen Soli, Alish Steger, and Ian Williams. Um, so one of the reasons that we want to launch these talks on translations is because the Poetry Prize is one of the few international prizes that celebrates poetry written in or translated into English. Over the last two decades, um, we, have, uh, we had 20 translated collections shortlisted from the prize works that were originally written in languages such as Albanian, Arabic, Danish, French, Hebrew, German, Korean, Mandarin, Chinese, Polish, and Spanish. Um, we're very proud of that tradition and we're excited to expand the conversation around translation and poetry by inviting former short shortlisted and witting poets to discuss the relationship between their poetic and translation practice. So thank you again, uh, Khalid and Sarah, for accepting this invitation and for being our first uh, guest to launch this a series tonight. Um, I will briefly read uh, your bios and um, and then we'll we'll begin the we'll proceed with the conversation. So uh, Khalid Matawa is a poet, a professor at the University of Michigan leading translator of Arabic poetry into English, a 2014 MacArthur Fellow, and 2011 Griffin Poetry Prize International Finalist for his translation of Adonis Selected Poems. He has also translated the works of Iman Mersal, Madam Al-Masri, Juman Haddad, Amjad Nasser, Fathil Al-Azawi, Saadi Youssef, and more. Sarah Riggs is a poet, writer, artist, filmmaker, and translator. Sarah has run the ongoing annual Tamas Translation Seminar since 2004-2005 with Cole Swenson and Omar Berada. She has translated and co-translated several contemporary French poets into English, including Oscarine Bosquet, Isabelle Garon, Marielle Borel, Ryoko Sikeguchi, 
and of course, Etelatnan's collection Time, for which they won the 2020 International Griffin Poetry Prize. Um, so thank you again for being here, and I'll pass it over to Adriana. Again. Thank you, Miren, so much. So um, again, thrilled that you're here. And as a jumping off point, could you both talk about your first encounter with translation? Uh, do you remember the first poem or text that you ever translated? And why did you feel compelled to translate it? We can begin with uh, maybe Khaled. Oh, let me unmute you. <laughs> Uh, I don't know the first one uh, exactly, but I've, uh, and again, uh, the story is uh, become uh, a, a point of reference uh, for me as to when I started writing to begin with. But uh, I would say um, Christmas time, 1988, uh, Brooklyn, New York, uh, Atlantic Avenue, Tripoli restaurant. I don't know if it still exists or not. And that area of a block of Arabic shops, finding uh, poems of Mahmoud Darwish in the early, uh, in his early books, and coming home uh, to uh, where I was staying and translating Mahmoud Darwish. I was also reading uh, Lorca's poet in New York because it was the, the pretentious thing to do for a poet being in New York, uh, and uh, sitting down reading translations and translating and sort of. Uh, finding a, a voice for myself through translation. That's beautiful. Yes, I think uh, I think I was in my early 20s in, in my hometown and uh, I had a book from my French class in college of Paul Verlaine and uh, it was bilingual edition. And I think I wasn't really that happy with the translation. And so I thought, well, maybe I can do my own version. And uh, it, had, it had a sol pleureur uh, willow tree, which is a particular favorite tree. That's all I recall. Wonderful. Now, of course, you both write your own poetry and you also translate the poetry of others. Um, could you talk about how these two aspects of your practice inform each other? How does your translation work feed into your poetry and uh, vice versa? I want to hear Sarah first. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, I mean, I, I started translating uh, French poets in, uh, or Francophone poets in uh, Paris where I was living and it became a way for me to at once work on the language since I'm less of a classroom learner than I am just a being in life learner. And uh, so, and I would always work on poets who are alive so I could ask them questions <laughs> and uh, get into it. And I think um, with uh, translating what became Etel's time, uh, you know, the, the, the sense of breath uh, really just like infused my work and I started doing a series. It started with the 28 telegrams and the, the ones that were published in English were the 60 textos, which are like text message poems. So, I mean, I was playing on technologies, but I was, I was channeling Atel's kind of seeming simplicity and strength. Um. <clears throat> Again, it's a part of the reading process. Translation is, is part of the reading process. Uh, and uh, it is what you're reading and it, it, sort of, it becomes a, a deeper form of reading to translate. Uh, it's, also, um, it's also almost like a weightlifting or, or uh, doing a form of uh, athletics to strengthen your, uh, your poetic uh, muscles or playing uh, uh, you know, if you're a composer sitting down to play another composer's music. So it is, uh, it's, it's almost, a, you are doing poetry, but in a way, it, uh, gratis in, 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 a, in a way that it's, it's not forced. You're not forced to, to use your uh, so-called uh, creative um, in, imagination of, 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 you know, coming up with your own material, but here's ready material that you, that you uh, can work with um, 
and uh, and so in that sense, uh, it's uh, it's just a way of staying in poetry. I think it's also you find poetry that you read and you feel like this must be available somehow. You know, you you read it and then you have this other luxury, which is you can sit down and write it up and translate it and say, well, in, in the language that you have. So sometimes translation is is not a matter of your you sort of your own choosing. It's it's a matter that uh, that uh, you feel even a sense of grief. Like here's this beautiful poem that uh, would be lost on other readers uh, if I if I didn't do it or or if it if it doesn't get translated. Plus you 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 do get render by rendering you get the pleasure of 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 uh, accomplishment. Um, the other side of it is that I found that I could stay in poetry through translation under almost uh, any circumstance. I, one time I found myself uh, uh, ne sitting next to my father in the hospital. He was not in danger, but he was in the hospital and kind of resting. And I was translating as he was, as he was resting. I could go to an airplane, a bus station, uh, anywhere. Uh, you find yourself being able to translate, not the same way with your own writing. How that um, feeds into your own work or my own work, I don't know. And frankly, I don't want to know because I, I don't want to know how Whitman or Stevens or Adrian Rich or uh, Adelia Prado has influenced uh, my work or uh, Langston Hughes. I, if I knew, I would scratch out every influence out of my work, but I, I want to keep the influence mysterious. But it's just another deeper way of, of uh, intaking poetry that I hope when, when I work, I'm surely drawing on it, but uh, you can't like sue me the way you sue people who uh, sample James Brown, because it's not that evident, I hope, uh, in my work that it's, it's there. Uh, but it's a melange of many people that I've read. Wow. Yeah, thank you for these these beautiful answers. I was struck by by many things that um, you both said. I, um, Khaled, just to, to bounce off what you just said in terms of uh, influences and thinking of translation rather as you know, a community of both um, people that are alive and, and no longer here um, and how to make these voice uh, present. Um, and that brings me back to what Sarah was saying in terms of channeling, you know, use the word channeling Sarah, which I think was quite beautiful when you were talking about the work of Etel um, and um, translation being a practice of, um, um, yeah, sort of, uh, communion or community with, with, with others. Um, and I was struck by something that you said, Sarah, in an interview, uh, and I think it was in, on the Night Boat uh, website. And I'm just gonna quote you here. You said um, that you wanted to translate Etel just to hear her, how her poem sounded in English. And um, you also said with Etel, perhaps because of all her years in California, and her having written and taught so many years in English and perhaps even her relation to journalism, I just wrote the translation as if I was writing my own poem. I was grateful to work with her. She just made a bunch of marks or in some cases just put out things and we could go over them together. So I was struck by this, by the sentence, I just wrote the translation as if it I've, as if I was writing my own poem. And I was wondering if you could sort of say a little bit more about that or um, about the kind of intimacy or trust that is required um, to approach, um, or friendship even that is required to sort of approach, uh, to develop that kind of reciprocity. Yeah, I mean, it, you know, I mean, this is this was last year's experience with a uh, Algerian Tunisian French poet, Suad Labiz. You know, we only worked through Zoom during the translation seminar, um, which lasts uh, five or six days, mm -hmm. and we kind of fell in love in the process. 
you know, which was amazing to me, like that you could do that without even having met the person, you know, and I think that there's, there's an incredible intimacy when you're asking questions like, well, what did you mean here? Like, what, what, what was the nuance? What were you, what were you trying to say? And then out comes a pouring of stories, you know, and, and backgrounds and contexts that are so rich and unfamiliar. Um, and I think that it's, it's, for me, it's a really like intimate way of, of coming up with the, with the foreign, with the, with I think the unknown aspect of it. And I think a lot of what drives um, the, the fear of the foreign is that you can't relate to it. You know, like you, you don't know how to relate. And I think that translating uh, mm -hmm. is like a deep, invitation into relating to that other person so that you know you you sort of you can you can hear that person so to the point that it doesn't even feel foreign anymore mm -hmm. like and I think also I think that anybody who writes poetry um you know tends to have a foreign relationship to their mother tongues their whatever however many tongues they have like that that they already are in a kind of unusual relationship to their language mm -hmm. so when you engage with somebody else who's that way in their language and then you try to bring it into your language or your languages in that way mm -hmm. i think there's it's 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 like it's like friendship you know right. can, can i'm very curious about can you say more about uh, translators having a foreign relationship to their own language. Can you just say a few words about that, what you mean? Yeah, I mean, I think that, uh, you know, I, I think that you're, you're attracted to fragments of language. You fragment the language and you, you pull out little bits of it and you linger on it. You linger on those strange passages. And so for me, I, and I know that this is true of a lot of poets, um, there's a way in which you come in and out of focus to regular speech. So mm -hmm. at a dinner table, mm -hmm. as a child, you have your own kind of imaginary realm that's going on and then you're connecting to the language. Um, sometimes you might have like a speech impediment or you might have a reading impediment or you know whatever it is like you know intense mental states but that that you over time and you find ways to articulate the unusual experience that you're having with respect to standardized speech right right yeah that's that's beautiful thank you um i I had a question uh, for Khalid about, and this is something that comes out of, again, one of the essays you wrote. Um, so th there is a perceived hierarchy between like original creative work, like poems and translation work, which is considered more as a form of, of straightforward labor. And uh, in one of your essays, Khaled, you challenge this assumption and you say, I'm going to quote you, I'm going to quote you, show me a poet who has revolutionized his language without translation, humble and subordinate as he or she is supposed to be in the service of the original text, the translator shares with the modern writer, the potential quote, to create new totalities, to cultivate random appetites, end of quote. And that was from uh, Edward Said. Um, so yeah, I, I was just wondering, Khaled, if you wanted to talk a little bit more about the higher, the perceived hierarchy between original poetic work and translation work and, and how you feel about it. Well, I don't feel very good about that. <laughs> But I do want to go back to the idea that um, that um, Sarah was all sort of mentioning uh, about the sort of the slight alienation or alienation from one's language or from modern speech or or even from poetry. I mean, you think of like the, the, the maybe the 1950s was when American poets um, 
uh, you know, feeling the heft of Eliot's uh, uh, cathedral tunes, if you will, uh, overbearing, wanted to translate. And this is where you're Robert Bly and James White and looking for Chinese poetry, Latin American poetry, and so on. So you have, um, uh, when you feel like your language is failing, and, and when you think of like the time when American poets were breaking away from uh, formalism in the late 40s and, and 50s and from the, 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 the modernists, had, that's when a, a, a sort of a, a translation um, uh, had uh, come in. Like the, if, you, if you don't find it in your language, you find it by hearing the other and bringing them to your language because they will renew your language. If you think of uh, Langston Hughes, Langston Hughes went to Senegal, I think in the mid 60s, he had no idea what a big poet he was, and he was feted and celebrated because his poems in translation are what brought about the negritude movement and how you know uh, 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 African poets managed to liberate themselves from colonial French by hearing uh, a poet from America uh, in French, giving them a new version of French that they could speak an African. Uh, form of uh, African American French, if you will, and so um, um, that sense of renewal is 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 what translation brings in. As to um, uh, that that sort of um, hierarchy, it's uh, it's. I mean, I think it's 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 common. Uh, it's also there. Are, there is all. I mean, I, when I hear students say, "Well, there's something missing in translation." I'm, uh, I'm, I have to calm down <laughs> uh, because I want to say, well, if we didn't have a translation, we would have nothing. We, you and I would not have understood anything. So there's a lot gained from translation. There's a, like a ready accusation of the translator betraying or not fulfilling something and that the original is more beautiful than the than the, the, the translation, which is um, stories of origin. I mean, maybe there's something uh, what you know, archetypal or uh, about this, this sort of, uh, there's a religious notion about the original uh, thing that could not be copied, or maybe it has a sense with, maybe it comes from a complex that has to do with the divine text, where the divine text ought not be translated or could never be matched because it is holy somehow. So I can't explain the, the sort of the collective unconscious uh, where that comes from, but I can say that, um, it, a lot lost in it uh, uh, culturally. We have that adaptation, but in fact, I would say that it is the reverse. There is so much gained by translation, and people who who translate are are working on on two fronts and are uh, you know uh, able to to sort of be bridges or uh, connections uh, uh, between um, realms of misunderstanding. That's really beautiful, Khaled. Um, I agree that there's so much gained. I think of the Italians and how they say, you know, traduttore, traditore. Yes. And, yeah. uh, and perhaps it's not like that. Um, that I'm reminded of Borges, you know, el original es infiel a la traducción. The original is unfaithful to the translation. Um, so it's, it's quite, quite interesting what you say. Um, Khaled, in, in an interview with Blackbird, you mentioned that translation is your form of activism, and it's also a terrible addiction, you say. Yeah. Um, you said, I've never been able to quit. I think yeah. if I quit translation, I might be able to quit cigarettes. I don't know which is harder, but yeah. it's been a great kind of company to keep while writing as well. So can you talk a little bit more about what makes translation addictive to you? And then Sarah, I'm not sure, do you find translation work addictive in that same way? Go ahead, Ken. Have it. Yeah, I, well, um, I stopped smoking. <laughs> <laughs> so clearly, it is more addictive. And I can tell you that I've continued to translate to English, but uh, with uh, 2011, 2010, and I, Sarah and I were uh, reminiscing about this a little bit, I began to translate to Arabic. Uh, and so clearly, uh, I just switched cigarette brands, if you will, and uh, instead of translating, <laughs> Translating from English to Arabic, I'm translating from uh, uh, no from Arabic to English, English to Arabic, and and uh, I run a website called Qasaid Lil Haya Poems for Life, which is uh, it's a poetry daily 
um, uh, if you will, version, but it's all international poems translated to Arabic, mostly through English as a medium language. The, the reason you can't stop translating because you are doing it all the time. Language is uh, the, the, a cliche in one language can become interesting in another. Uh, you are, you know, it, it, that's how you sort of um, uh, peel the the rust over language uh, translation does that like if you translate it something you, there's a there's a new life in the in the words when they're translated and and as in books uh, it, every, every phrase when translated gets a, a new life if you will and books from other languages they could sit around for 20 years and they're translated they, they gain an afterlife in translation so um so that's that's the the, the, the power of it, I can't stop it because I, I do it all the time. I'm, uh, I'm encountering it all the time. And uh, I know a little bit of French. And so that sort of even adds a little bit of, 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 uh, of the difference. Like how is it said in French? How is it said in English? How is it said in Arabic? And all of these differences are illuminating. And so that may be part of the, the addiction is that it's, once you are in it, it's hard to ignore it. And also then you're never alone, you know? Mm -hmm. I mean, whether you do translation collectively or you just do it on your own, you have this, this other voice, this other persona so that you're exploring uh, somebody else is in the room with you, you know? And it is, um, I don't feel like doing it all the time, but it, it definitely feeds, feeds my work. Um, I feel like doing it more when I'm in a foreign context uh because I, I i feel the incentive to get close you know because maybe it is that level of alienation that extra level of alienation when you're in a in a foreign culture that uh makes me want to you know really embrace what i think is like if you're translating you ha you're making mistakes all the time you can't get it right you cannot get it right which is why i think it's so funny that translation is so often criticized particular translations for you know not not being true to the text because there is no there is no truth i think um but it's it's also really fun I don't know. <laughs> I mean, it's like you get to write poetry as if, you know, you're somebody else, you know, it's like taking on different personalities. And you get to live that difference. I mean, that is that, uh, I mean, Adonis was uh, one of the poets who was so, you know, is, is, uh, there's an element of like a higher level of modernism. Uh, Sadi Yusuf was a closer to poet to, to the kind of poetry I wrote in many ways still write a much more sort of tactile, uh, daily quotidian poetry. Uh, but then with Adonis, it was you know you get to, you get to be the Adonis, you got to be sort of the heroic figure that is sometimes many speaks in the poems. Sometimes um, it sounds like a, a Gilgamesh that's so powerful and and poetic and and in a way. It, uh, you get to act, you get to put on a mask as a translator uh, you, to play a role in some ways. And it's, it's, it's great, it's great fun that way. Yeah, I mean, when I was studying uh, poetry, re studying Arabic with Safa Fati, mm -hmm. the uh, Egyptian, French Egyptian uh, poet and translator and philosopher, filmmaker, she, uh, she got me to read my first line and it was Darwish, <laughs> you know, cause like I had so much incentive. I was like, I can, I can do this. <laughs> this is what I want to read. You know, like this is how I know another language is through its poetry. Yeah. That, that's so fascinating. Thank you both for these answers. It's almost as, I, I like what, that you mentioned acting Khalid. It's almost as translating is, is putting on a fictional persona, right? And sort of experiencing a character's, um, uh, voice and world in that sense. Um, and perhaps related to that, I wanted to ask you, Sarah, a little bit more specifically about, you, you already mentioned, you already, you, you already spoke about the process of translating uh, time, but could you talk a little bit more about um, your collaboration with Etel? Because, um, you know, Etel herself writes 
poetry and books in both languages, right? She writes in, in French and in English. And so I was wondering about her relationship to your translation of her poems in English, from French to English. And um, yeah, if you could just say a few words about, um, about the process and um, about your collaboration. Well, initially uh, she would just make a few little changes, you know, she would mark up a copy. But uh, when we got to what I translated as No Sky, uh, she rewrote the poem in the translation process <laughs> so that the original became something completely different. And luckily, uh, Stephen Motika, the editor of Nightboat, was fine with, you know, our, my having a translation and an original that didn't match, you know, it was like, it's, just, it's okay, you know, so that that was good. But um, I, I took a lot of liberties in English. Uh, um, I, I say, you know, the clouds, a sheep in the sky, like a sheep as one word. Um, and I think, you know, like, like you just look for spots where you can evoke the kind of energy that you feel in the original, you know, and, and just like, they might, they might not match up to the spots where Etel was doing it. So you find other spots just to, to kind of, cause it has to, it has to dazzle to kind of enter into the reader. Yeah, thank you. Oh, um, both of you, uh, Khaled and Sarah are engaged community members who have initiated organizations and cultural and literary platforms in the Arab world and beyond. Um, Sarah, through Tamas, you've hosted yearly translation seminars um, in which our translators have co collaborated since 2004. And Khaled, you've spearheaded various uh, cultural initiatives like the um, Aret Foundation for Arts and Culture, promoting the arts in, in Libya and exposing young Libyan artists to international art. So um, I was wondering whether you could both say more about your organizational work and your labor towards nurturing environments in which culture and art emerge, especially when there may be a lack of infrastructure. Uh, if I may start, I was maybe exposing them to danger too as well. We had a book in 2017 that uh, caused a big ruckus in Libya because of the, the Wahhabis objected to certain passages. Uh, but I want to go back to this idea of, of you know, metaphors for translation, uh, which is, uh, it is like a, um, what was the last one we talked about? It's like um, it was. It's like a dance. You had a, a, a text dance, it tangoing with another text. It is like a, a something or other. But I think it should be the reverse. The reverse is that it's translation that perhaps taught us how to uh, transform something into a dance, like not understanding someone. Uh, it turns you into a kind of a, a, vis, a, a kind of a physical person. It's the idea that something could not e be expressed in words that had to be expressed in other forms of art, perhaps. So translation is should be the the originary metaphor to say that to perform a ballet is to like translating a, a poem or translating a text. So I, I want to reverse that sort of analogy that that, that many ways translation. Is uh, is at the origin of of metaphor. It is at the origin of transferring something into something else. It is the carriage, which is what metaphor uh, is. And I would say, if you get hooked into translation, you also get hooked into the possibility. Maybe this art can go somewhere else. Maybe this art, if it can transcend linguistic barrier, cultural barrier, why isn't it possible? Than to to break from uh, uh, another form of barrier. So in a sense, being in the uh, activism of translation is um, uh, a sense of well maybe there's a an obstacle that can be broken, and that brings in 
a lot of potential, a lot of possibilities, a lot of imaginative solutions to problems. And once you have those, you're responsible in dreams. Uh, I'm forgetting the verb. In dreams stand responsibilities and uh, the, the translator, the possibility maker, imaginer, then becomes responsible uh, for the potentialities of interaction and connection between people that translation uh, brings. So I would, I would owe it to, in many ways, the activism, if you will, to translation, because I never, it allowed me to think of being an artist as a, as a, a connector rather than somebody, somebody's out of the world in some form or fashion, rather than somebody who's isolated, trying to uh, squeeze the, 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 you know, the, 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 the creativity uh, out of their uh, mind. Of course, that's, that's, we do that, but also that's not the only way that there is a, a way in which you connect people and ideas. And, uh, and so translation is at, is at the heart. It's the enabling sense of agency that, that uh, has instilled in me, I would say, that, uh, that allowed me to do that. I, you know, I came to translation through a French English axis from one colonizing country to another colonizing country. So from the US to France um, with a Canadian mother. And over the course of many years, particularly when I arrived in the United States uh, in 2014, uh, I realized that my sort of Benetton ad uh, sort of vision of multiculturalism was just not going to work anymore. <laughs> and uh, we started inviting explicitly, you know, Arab poets to Paris where we were doing the, the, those summer workshops. Um, and then in the last couple years, we've um, and it, last year we had uh, 12 poets, all, all women, it wasn't, wasn't set out to be that way, but, and eight of them Arab. And now we have a book coming out that just got a National Endowment for the Arts uh, grant through Litmus Press. So a Tomas uh, anthology, if you will, of, of all the Arab poets who've, um, translated and with us over these years. So that has to come out this year. So we're working on it right now, madly. <laughs> um, but I think, uh, you know, it, it's exciting and it's kind of humbling to realize that as a, as a white New Yorker, I can play a role in not only cross-cultural, but Arabs meeting Arabs and like collaborating with each other in a way that they might not have otherwise, you know, it's, uh, it's kind of phenomenal. And I don't even, I, you know, I'm not proficient in Arabic, although I try, but uh, I did have one experience with Omar of uh, working on translations of the uh, poems from the Thousand and One Nights from the ancient Arabic, so. Yeah, that, that's amazing. And um, yeah, I was just, as you were talking, Sarah, I was, I was thinking about how um, it's not only about, um, you know, making Arabic literature exist, you know, to like, um, let's say a, an Anglo, an Anglophone audience or Western audience, but really about, I love this, this focus on developing conversations, regional conversations within, you know, um, the poets themselves and, um, and uh, expanding, you know, these communities um, because, you know, the Arab world is very fragmented in itself. So, you know, um, a lot of poets don't, don't have a chance to meet. So I think that's, um, it's a great initiative. Um, I don't know. I, I think, um, we had, we had a couple of more questions, but I was also wondering if you had questions for each other, Saran Khaled, did you want to ask each other, um, 
something that we didn't address in the conversation. Yeah, I, I was interested, Halid, um, in how your poetry has evolved over the years, the kind of styles that you're writing in. And, you know, if you, if you, if you can track the evolution, maybe in connection to things you've been translating. Um, I, I guess I've become a, I don't know if I've become a more, what you call documentary, documentary poet or documentarian or in some ways, uh, but I've, since my first book was largely autobiographical, uh, there was a section in the middle of it that was uh, sort of trying to cover part of history, if you will. Uh, but then I just, I really, I didn't have a lot of, you know, my personal stories were lost in what I thought I wanted to say about the world I lived in. And um, and so, uh, but but I'm very deeply interested in lyric. Um, so, so I can't, I don't, I don't know if translation has deepened my sense of like wanting to be uh, a chronicler of my own time or to be a witness. Uh, the last book, uh, Fugitive Atlas, has a, 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 a really very much a, about the, this last decade, whether it's the Arab Spring or the uh, Mediterranean refugee crisis. Uh, whatever lyric, pure lyric, is in is studied within the the, the 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 history, if you will, uh, and so. I don't know how. I don't know where that comes. I know that um, that at least in uh, whether it's Sadi wrote poems that were on a daily basis. He kind of told the story of his life, even though he's looking at small elements on a daily uh, basis. Uh, Adonis wanted to write the grand uh, up, uh, epic, so I don't know if that was uh, instilled from there. Uh, I but I. But I don't know. Um, um, I think um, maybe a sense of a, a shorter poem, a deeper desire for formal experimentation is maybe the challenge of uh, of uh, knowing uh, poets who are ambitious and uh, whether you are trying to be more formal or saying, well, you know, the. the there are ways for me to break that out. The poets I've published, uh, translated, have done that. So maybe a sense of range is widened by through translation, uh, formal range, if you will. Mm. And what about you? Yeah, I think. Uh, well, I used to think that there were two kinds of poets: one who kind of in gets more deeply entrenched in their style with each book. Mm -hmm. And then the poets who change each from one book to the next. And uh, I'm not sure I would say that anymore. I think yeah. there's a lot more versatility in any poet's career, but um, I'm definitely influenced by what I'm reading and translating. And uh, um, I, have recently translated with uh, Jeremy Robert, mm -hmm. um, a book of a, a, a poet in the Palestinian diaspora, Olivia Elias, uh, which, you know, uses song and chant and um, is, is, is very strong politically. Um, and I think that that, has entered into my sense of what can go into a poem, <laughs> you know, because that's not what I was taught in college. <laughs> yeah. Well, how how is it translating with someone else? How do you divvy up the work or or don't? Or, or... Uh, well, uh, I mean, in this case, I guess I did a full first draft, and then so we work. We weren't we. My co-translator is in Reunion Island, so we're we're just exchanging drafts yeah. over the phone and WhatsApp and the email. Um, so, but I do, um, you know, with time, I owe a lot to Cole Swenson and Jeremy mm -hmm. and Alicia Mascaranes, who's here, mm -hmm. uh, who each read drafts and um, made suggestions, and so. I had this huge table where I was just like, I had 
each person's comments and then the stanza that I was working on and I was just sort of like assimilating all these different viewpoints. But I, 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 I like to work with different ideas and voices because I just, I'm just not sure, like, I'm not sure I can hear it, you know? And if I get, if I get a few other suggestions, then it helps me to hear more clearly what I can say. Mm -hmm. So I guess I would say that even my solo translations are co-translations. Mm -hmm. Well, that's great. Yeah. And it's, it's hard a little bit sometimes when I, I've tried to work with, uh, there are not many poetry translators to, from the Arabic or, or uh, and uh, sometimes relying on scholars of uh, the uh, sometimes can be very um, very challenging because they they would say why is that and why is this and why is that and why is this and why is it so it's, 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 you're like dealing with you want to get the the literal translation correct but then you find that a lot of the poetic solutions are are not going to pass the um, the literal uh, interpretations and so. Um, uh, then you would have to say, well, you know, I know why I did this. Uh, so in a sense, you get a lot of these, a lot of feedback and you have to figure out where is the feedback that's helping you when it comes to literal readings of the poem and where is the feedback that uh, that's not. So in a sense, uh, it's, it's maybe a little bit of the opposite rather than try to sort of work something with many good translations. It's, uh, it's trying to figure out where um, the, the 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 most needed uh, you know corrections or translations that that uh, that a literal interpreter is uh, is helping out with. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but they're they're I'm grateful to nit those n uh, nitpicky folks for <laughs> catching me every now and then. <laughs> I saw I saw that Iman Marsal was in the audience. I don't know if she's still here, uh, but you've translated her and she participated in one of our translation workshops and Great. yeah i remember her being quizzical of the so-called poet translator she's like well the poets want to take all these liberties you know yeah. <laughs> she's Iman. uh Iman has translated uh prose the charles simic uh but uh yeah so uh, yeah she's not entered the fray so much with translation but i hope she would but yeah. She's not doing private chat either, so. <laughs> <laughs> Good to see you guys. I'd close and mute myself again. Bye. <laughs> <laughs> well, maybe we can turn to the audience. Yes, let's turn to the audience. So if you have a question for our guest, please raise your hand and we will uh, call on you. Or just jump in. Yeah. <laughs> okay, David. Hi. Um, thanks. Uh, thanks for what a, um, a, a great sort of talk tonight. Um, uh, Thank you, especially to Khaled, um, because you were my introduction to Adon Adonis. I absolutely love your translation. And um, so thank you for introducing me to that poet. Otherwise, as a non-Arabic speaker, I never would have uh, experienced him. And um, thanks for your work, Sarah. With like, I'm a, I'm a French speaker and translator. So um, uh, I just awesome work that you do. So thank you both for, uh, for, for speaking tonight. I guess my question is, when you start to do a translation, what's what's your favorite part? What thing do you look forward to the most when you begin, either a new poem, a new piece, a new book? Um, what's your what's your favorite thing you look forward to doing? <laughs> well, I love to go fast. I love to just like 
um, write down as quickly as I can a, a first draft um, and just not stop for the words that I don't know. Just leave a little underline there, come back to them um, so that I can get the energy and the kind of spirit of the piece. Same here. Uh, it's, it's a real um, trick we play on ourselves. We think that by getting that first draft, uh, I, I'm there, I'm, but that first draft ends up maybe only 10% of, of the work, but you, it's like uh, falling in love or whatever. You, wanna, you, wanna, you want everything to happen right then. Uh, but then, <laughs> you know, there's more work to do after that first draft. But you, wanna, you want to get there, you want to have a structure. In a way, it, it, it's kind of like uh, with, with your own poem, when you are writing your own poem, you, you, it doesn't take a long time to actually, you know, if, if you are in that mood where the, a poem is coming, it, it's, you know, it, it's not going to be the odyssey, it's going to be a, a little burst at a time. And so you want to be there, you want to make sure that it doesn't, uh, it doesn't spill out of your hands and you, you want to be focused and, and, and get it. Uh, and and so with the translation, you want to you know move at it, and 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 partly it's because you want to get a sense of the whole thing. If you, you want to, when you translate it all at once in that first draft, you get a feel for it, uh, like wearing the whole coat and jacket and stuff, and how your body is fitting into it. And so that's that's why that first draft, uh, that exhilarating process, uh, and it's the commitment. Once you have that first draft, it's hard to to give up on the poem. That's true. I love that. that. Do you have a, you. a do you have a special translation outfit? <laughs> <laughs> I am not going to say. <laughs> no, I don't. Uh, uh, we do have a question in the chat. Thank you, David Siller, for that wonderful question. We have a, a question in the chat here. Um, from Sai Chandra Moli. Um, do you feel that a translator needs to be an interpreter as well? What's an interpreter? Uh, like a, a literary interpreter, like being able to give a critical reading of the poem? I believe, I, I don't want to speak for Sai Chandra Moli. You can jump in, please. But is an interpreter someone who can interpret live a situation for someone, like verbally? I mean, I, I could, while this is sort of playing out, I, I think, you know, the stronger the translation is, the more interpretations that are possible of a given line. Like if, if it's too flat, there's only one meaning there. Um, it, it's, it would be heavy like an interpretation. Um, so, so no, I don't, I don't think, I, I mean, I think a plurality of interpretations would be what you're trying to embrace. We have several questions in the chat, but we also have a raised hand, Omar. Um, maybe we can go to your question and then go back to the chat. Sure, thank you. And thank you all for a very um, moving and lively, entertaining conversation. Uh, I had a question for Khaled about about the fact that you have translated and been translating in both ways, Arabic to English and English to Arabic. And, and I know it, you didn't necessarily mean to do that from the very beginning. I mean, I know, I don't know actually, but, but I'm, I'm interested in both the, you know, the, the context or the reasons that led you, the differential reasons that led you to do one and or the other, and also the, the what can I say like the, the function of both in your writing uh you know like what what has it done to you to translate into Arabic versus into English uh thanks I'm good to see you um well I think the again part of the that project um I must say that I uh saw 2008 or 2009, a Norton Anthology World Literature, uh, big 
thick book. And I just envy the English language for having such a thing. Uh, it's like, wow, they really, they got it. I mean, it's, it's English, they have it, they can do this. And in it or works from, uh, you know, 3000 year old. And so I say, why isn't there something like that in Arabic? And then uh, it's like, I said, well, it would take me 25 years to, <laughs> to do this, you know, volume of uh, pages. But I, I felt like, a, and, you know, envious for, for Arabic. Um, and there were texts, like, I don't think the uh, Arab uh, world knows about this, um, the Book of Songs, the Chinese Book of Songs, or the Songs of the South, uh, the Hal Halab poems from, from India. There was so much that I felt like Arabic should have and would know. And so, um, so there was that. And then with the, with the revolutionary atmosphere, uh, one idea was, that, you know, the, 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 that there was, in Gaddafi's Libya, I mean, there was so much lacking, so much missing. The music died in, in many ways. The literature was, was uh, censored uh, uh, much more so than elsewhere. The whole cultural development of the country was, was, uh, was, uh, was really, um, uh, you know, slathered with algae and dying. And so, uh, and so I, I thought again, it's like well, there is a lot of poetry that can be brought in, uh, a lot of literature that can be brought in. And the focus on poetry was that these are like small doses of, of thought and sympathy and, and rage uh, that can be brought in. More particularly, I wanted to have poetry be available to filmmakers, to, uh, to, uh, to uh, musicians, to just introduce them to a different way of, of thinking. So it was part of, of like what you don't have in your country or your language, perhaps you can, you can bring in to Arabic. And uh, one of those like teaching uh, Robert Hayden's poem, Those Winter Sundays, I taught that in, in University of Tripoli and the connection the, the students made like 40 of them or whose English was pretty good. It's kind of amazing. It was like a magical moment in my life to have, here's a poem that we kind of worked through and, and translated to Arabic. And it just broke through for 80 years of, of, of time gap or, or uh, and cultural difference and opening to stories. Who's Robert Hayden? Who's his family, etc. All of that was, um, was uh, and and the license it gave some of these folks to write about their fathers whom they had complicated relationships with. So again, it was um, it was uh, a way to connect to open up opportunities. What I did for me, uh, I would say also I was tired of this business of being a cultural informant. Uh, you know, and I was also seeing that, okay, that now we're done with Iraq. We've got Iraq world poets, we want them during the war. Let's uh, have them being published. Khaled Matawa wants to translate them, fine. And then, okay, um, who else? What's next? Uh, maybe come to the, the whole, the way, and even poetry gets caught up in the in the sort of the capitalist endeavor of of wanting to maybe understand these people and figure out who they were, and maybe we read their poetry and oh, let's get the translators to provide us this. I, I, it, it's and then everything is tired. The way that sort of the way literature is caught up in the news cycle sometimes, and my part in it to to provide for the the, the metropolitan world. Uh, this commodity, if you will, uh, it's art, of course, and I respect it. But just the fact that it was uh, that it was it was there was an element of it that was there. I said, you know, I, I'm I maybe I should take a break and do translation where nobody's looking for anything, and uh, I'd have to just talk about the beauty of things uh, and and the beauty of uh, Machado to to uh, to Arab poets and who are no, there's no. There's nobody attacking Spain, <laughs> and not now. Uh, uh, or, or there isn't any kind of political context that that really taints the 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 way um, uh, Arab writers sometimes are brought into 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 America or into the 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 uh, the, the, the Western world, uh, where it's all about let's get this out. This is a conflict. This is a poet writing about conflict. Uh, the women authors often are brought into into this, and I and I admire all the Arab women writers 
Iman and Dunya among them, especially mm -hmm. who are uh, playing against this um, this uh, sort of uh, marketability, if you will. So, uh, so in, in a way, you could say a slight refusal to translate uh, and to be so readily available for something that was. Uh, People are not aware of it. Our liberal friends are not aware of it, but things are politicized in a way that they are not aware of. Great, thank you so much for this uh, answer, Khalid. Um, I, we have a couple of questions in the chat. Perhaps we could answer a few of them. Um, I don't know, maybe one or two. One is just um, Noor Bishuti was just asking for the name, Sarah, of your recent collaboration with the Palestinian poet. Oh, her, uh, the name of the poet is Olivia Elias. Mm -hmm. So Olivia Elias, okay. Thank you. Um, moving on to another question uh, by uh, a Bofa, um, thank you all. I was captured by the thought of someone or a group being able to liberate themselves by hearing a new form of language. Can this be accomplished through translation? Can you, can you repeat the question? I, I, the translation would be. So um, I was captured by the thought of someone or a group being able to liberate themselves by hearing a new form of language. Can this be accomplished through translation? I, I mean, yeah, I mean, to some extent you're creating this third thing that's neither the original and or the translation <laughs> it's like it's it's like this this language that's been inflected with um with all kinds of differences um so yes i think it's, it's happening well uh, the translation is a, a laboratory for that because it uh it it does sort of enact the change it's finding uh, equivalencies it's uh, breaking up the, the language from its own cliches uh, and, and syntactically and, and also by just combining words in a different way. Uh, sometimes you do have, um, um, as Elliot said, poetry is the most national of the arts, uh, but it's also in many ways the most international. But sometimes you do have something that's an experimental in its in a, in a given language in a way that may not be transferable. Uh, certain puns, certain sounds, certain uh, allusions that may not. Uh, so you 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 can definitely try to liberate your own language, and without the aid of translation, or also where translation would have to either be equally creative and liberated from your experiment can be inspired by the experiment, but not replicated literally. So there are some things that, I don't know if you need translation, but translation can definitely, has definitely imbued inspiration and a desire for change in, in a language, in a host language. Uh, but sometimes some things that are radical in one language may not become as radical or another, or maybe just seen as odd and strange because the translation can't provide all the context that you need for the radicalism or the changes that occur in a given cultural language. Thank you. And maybe just we'll end with this question by Yosefina. Um, what do you think about translation poetry through an intermediary language? It, it is the case of minor languages which do not have professional translators.
so Josefina, I don't know if you're uh, still here, if you yeah, want I, to. I can add, uh, yes. it's the specificity of, uh, I'm teaching, I'm Romanian and I'm teaching Romanian in Azerbaijan. So actually uh, the Romanian literature and the Azerbaijani literature are not translated directly. They are translated, mediated by Russian. So mm. I found myself in the, <laughs> Uh, in the weird situation that I couldn't understand Eminescu, uh, trying to translate Eminescu from the Azerbaijani, of course, with Google Translator, but it was not Eminescu, our national poet, because it was mediated by Russian. So what I've done with my students and with some writers from here, from uh, writers' units in Azerbaijan, was that I, um, I, we, the whole team, we managed to publish uh, 20 poems by Eminescu uh, with a direct translation from uh, Romanian to Azerbaijani. I can say that uh, all the literature that is translated into Romanian from Azerbaijan and vice versa, it's not direct. It's just with, uh, with uh, mediation from Russian. So uh, you as professionals, I'm just a lecturer and uh, translation is an add to my, uh, to my courses. Uh, I'm asking you as uh, professionals, what do you think of this kind of uh, translating? Uh, literary works especially because it, it's about this thank you yeah mm, well i can tell you that uh, uh for experiences sake uh we found it uh, important to translate to, to i could not claim that the website to arabic that i have can have uh, poets from 60 or 70 countries except through English, in some cases uh, through uh, French, maybe Spanish sometimes, uh, but most of the translations we have are mediated through English. And so um, it's been helpful. There isn't always a way to verify uh, how truthful the translation uh, is, but um, again, uh, even here you would have to say, uh, there is more gained from translation than there is uh, a loss. It would be preferable that we wouldn't have uh, a, a mediating language, but uh, I feel like it's also been a useful thing to have available. Yes, thank you. Uh, definitely, it's it's very important to to have this uh, to act to this kind of uh, literature, even with mediation. But uh, I was interested in, if in the process of translation, there are some peculiarities or something that could be gained or lost uh, during this, because we also talk about cultural environment, the mindset of the translator, the double mindset actually of the translator. So it's, it's quite a complicated process when you have a, a, a language in between. So this is my I mean, one thing that I can say, I, I've been spending a lot of time with the Lenape dictionary, uh, speaking dictionary, which is online, the Lenape people who um, are the originary people of this area in Brooklyn. And it is so amazing to have that resource. So to be able to, you know, invest in and create online dictionaries um, for the various languages um, that are more remote or, you know, going extinct, um, I think is one thing that I, I, I know that I want to be involved in emphasizing. Yeah, I haven't thought about that, how technology can, can be a part of that, but it could be. Where, I mean, there is something sometimes called the secondary translator where you can have um, uh, uh, someone, you know, you can have a poem perhaps translated into English, and then perhaps the English can be translated into Romanian or uh, Azerbaijani, but somebody, like they would need more mediations perhaps, but, but the mediating language can be, what, what I'm saying is that it can be serve a mediating role, but it doesn't have to be, like the finalizing role in a sense, like okay, let's we get we read we have a draft from from English, 
it's good. Let's see if we can go back and, and track the original uh, and, and have a few more people involved. And uh, and so it it can it, I mean it is it is it can serve as an as a as a as a trailer or as a way of introducing us to poems that we don't have. But uh, the any effort to actually have the two poems, the two languages connect directly without a mediating language um, would be great. Uh, it's just uh, for expediency's sake, I would say it's not possible. And I weighing the benefits and the and the and the and the, uh, and the negative circumstances uh, using a mediating language such as English as a form of translation was, uh, was helpful and remains helpful, but be preferable that it wasn't, that it wouldn't, that we don't have to use it. Thank you. Thank you so much for those generous responses. And this whole discussion has been so thought-provoking. We really appreciate you both being here, Halid and Sarah. And um, we've recorded this event, and of course, we'll be sharing clips from it on social media that are so inspiring. Um, especially, I loved what Halid said about translation being at the at the very origin of metaphor. It's just so many beautiful things were said here, and we hope to share it with even more people. So, our next translation talks will be in March. Uh, please keep your eye out on our Instagram and Twitter and Facebook. We'll be announcing that shortly. And uh, one more thing is that the Griffin Poetry Prize shortlist will be announced uh, this April. Our judges for this year are Adam Dickinson, Valgina Mort, and Claudia Rankin. Um, so we hope to see you at our next gathering. Thank you once again for joining us from all over North America and even Azerbaijan. We really, really appreciate it. And uh, a special, another special thank you to Khaled and Sarah Riggs for being here today. Thank you. Adrian. Everyone, thank you so much. Everyone. Good to see you, Sarah. Amar. Bye, everyone. Bye. Bye, Bye everyone.